After a long day of caring for her child, it's perfectly acceptable for a mom to kick back with a glass of wine. So why should smoke on the joint be viewed differently? A British media outlet recently profiled a group of Beverly Hill moms who proudly consume marijuana, even claiming that it boosts their parenting skills. Joining me to discuss the future of pot and parenting, we have in our Google Plus Hangout, Diane Fornbacher. She's the publisher of Ladybud.com and the board member of the Normal Women's Alliance in Collingswood, New Jersey. Dale Scott Sky Jones, Executive Chancellor at the Oakers, Oaksterdam University and Chairwoman of the Coalition for Cannabis Reform in Oakland, California. Diane Goldstein, a retired lieutenant and currently a speaker for law enforcement against prohibition in Santa Ana, California. And Cheryl Schumann, a marijuana smoking mom in Beverly Hills. Hi, y'all. Hey Hi there. there. Well, I have to say, Cheryl, they didn't know you were joining, but we have the sharpest tongue. Pot is big biz in Beverly Hills, and I'll be there next week, just saying. So, Cheryl, you might have some visitors, but what do you have to say about the marijuana moms who say smoking weed makes them better parents? You actually are part of this, right? Well, um, these young women came to our home. This is my daughter, Amy. Uh, she's also my business partner. And we actually just finished up a canvas tasting we here with the Today Show. So forgive the, the lights. It was great. Mm -hmm. But um, yes, these were young ladies that had attended our cannabis tasting and a filming that we did for a British network. And uh, yes, that's one of the things that we had come up with is that for me personally, I feel that canvas makes me a better mom with my daughter because quite and as frankly, a daughter I can agree I absolutely <laughs> agree with it makes her a better mom you know it's um for me I have chronic pain issues and I was going through cancer treatments so for me it just provided me with a superior quality of life so that I can enjoy my children and you know it's it's nice to still be here after you know being told that I wouldn't and um you know it, it for me it's been a true blessing and I know that works for a lot of women and and I think it does give people a better quality of life because there are so many people that are addicted to opiates and uh, different prescription pills. There are so many people addicted to alcohol and cannabis is safer than alcohol. And um, so, yes, I'm in a different situation because my children are grown. Um, so I can't speak on behalf of all moms, but um, I can speak on behalf of Moms for Marijuana, uh, headed up by Sarah Frank, and say that there are a lot of amazing women who are moms that find that cannabis works well for them for whatever their uh, medical needs are. Well, we have a comment here from 113. I'll crack open a beer for this segment. This sounds funny, but Diane F., this is not a laughing matter. I mean, we're dealing with a lot of, a large contingency of individuals dealing with stereotypes and, uh, and reasons that they can't acknowledge this aspect of their life that's extremely important because being a mom comes with its own set of stigmas <laughs> and stereotypes. Diane F., can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Great. Did, did you just hear my question? Um, I was just passed through. Would you mind repeating? Of course, yeah. So what we're dealing with is, you know, people think this is a funny conversation. It's, it's something that is novel. Ooh, mom's getting high. Of course they are. Uh, but it's a, a more complicated issue because you're dealing with the stereotypes of, of weed and marijuana in general, but also the stereotypes of being a mother on top of that. And sometimes the two don't collide very well in the media. Well, I think mothers are unfairly judged, and to be frank with you, the drug war is far from over. We do have two legal states that are still uh, laying down the tracks of the law and how we're going to move forward in the future, but I would really like to see more coverage about women who are still having to give birth in shackles because, believe it or not, it's still legal in our country to do that. Um, I want children to not worry about having SWAT kick down their doors and having a gun to their head simply because their parents may or may not choose to consume cannabis because this also happens a lot in mistaken home raids uh, with the intention of busting people for cannabis. And if they ever even find cannabis, in many cases, it's simple possession, not a lot of uh, cannabis that they intend to sell. So... For me, as a mother, it's difficult in a state like New Jersey to say that I consume cannabis, although I may think that it's very awesome for very many different reasons. Um, I can't say that I consume cannabis currently because the authorities will come and take my children. 
Well, and you you entirely understand that from a very personal point of view. It's interesting because when you're talking about the the drug war, we have our wonderful community member Nikon here, who's so excited about this segment. This wonderful story over on the main right now. I thought it was honestly going to be about the marijuana moms, but it was actually about how marijuana accounts for the vast majority of drug seizures on the Mexican border. Uh, but then we got this comment, which again is starting about talking about the stereotypes. John Shaw, well, as long as you're white, it's all right alluding to the fact that you don't have to deal with these issues if you're like a middle-class suburban mom, but you did. You had CPS knocking on your door. Yes, and oddly enough, and quite ironically, considering all of my cannabis activism, they came to my house because my son mentioned that hemp would sol solve all of the Earth Day problems they were presenting at school. Um, and when they asked him, uh, what is hemp, because we keep our society and our teachers at large uneducated about the vast industrious qualities of the hemp plant itself, he said, because I don't lie to him, that hemp is like marijuana, but you can't get high from it. So they didn't even listen to what he was trying to say about hemp and how it might help the world. They only heard marijuana and generally assumed that I was neglecting my children, and that is why they came to my house. Ladies, I'd love to touch on Yes, we would love that. Yes, please, Diane Goldstein. You know, I'm here literally speaking from the public safety aspect side of it as a speaker for law enforcement against prohibition. What I find is that what happens is, you know, in California, mothers are a little bit more fortunate, but it's still a presumption that if you smoke marijuana, even responsibly, you can lose your children. And until that gets changed, you're going to see mothers uh, and, and a lot of other people get stigmatized. Now, the drug war is an abject failure. We spend more money on marijuana enforcement than, uh, than we should. It diverts critical resources from job creation and from education and from health care and from things that really would make our community better. So what we have to start focusing on is the way that we're going to win this is by engaging our politicians through activism and letting them know it's okay to speak the truth because behind closed doors, they all say marijuana should be legal, but they're afraid that it's going to lose them votes. It's a public safety issue, you know, from, from a criminal aspect is the more dollars we invest in marijuana enforcement, the less dollars we have to go towards real crime. Last year, there was, or actually a couple uh, weeks ago, there was a, um, a report by CNN that shows over 400,000 untested rape kits in our country. That's clearly a war not just on women, because there's men that are victims of sexual assault too. And the reason for it that nobody's discussing is every time there's an in-custody drug offender or a ticket written for a marijuana citation, it takes priority over violent and serious crime. Well, and Diane G, I think that's an, it's an interesting aspect of it. And already on top of the priority on marijuana as a, as a crime, do you think that marijuana utilizing parents get a double dose? Do you think they're even more targeted than the, the general population that uses marijuana? Absolutely, because one of the things that's not talked about is one of the things that happened in federal law a few years back. When children get taken away from their parents, whether folks understand this or not, is county children protective services gets a bounty, so to speak, every time they adopt a child out. So it doesn't, so they go in, and, and it's absolutely horrific. With alcohol, we don't take children away from their parents if you're responsibly having a glass of wine or if you're responsibly using prescription drugs because you have to. We only take them away when they commit a, a behavior that clearly endangers their children. But drug marijuana offenses, they just take them away simply because they're using marijuana and that's a waste of resources. Dale, jump in here, because a lot of people uh, are probably thinking they need to be taking it away because it's horrible and it's awful. Uh, but I think this comment here alludes to a point that you might be able to make. Kyle Goldfinch, is there still a misunderstanding of the pot benefits? Many people are really terrified that uh, it might be doing something terrible to the children. Well, I, I think that that's really where a lot of these draconian laws come from and why we are willing to put pregnant moms in prison in Texas or Oklahoma for 12 years mandatory federal time 
just uh, frankly for consuming cannabis uh the reality of the situation is, and, and, and this is the unfortunate part, is no one really understands in the mainstream what cannabis does. And prohibition has prevented the research and discussion of such things. We don't even discuss the endocannabinoid system in our medical schools, and yet this is the mother of all systems. The endocannabinoid system actually regulates all of your other systems. And so the quote unquote chemicals that are found in cannabis are actually identical to the chemicals that are found in breast milk. So you're not actually adding something like an opiate or alcohol that's uh, affecting the child in the same way. And there are actually studies to prove this. Now we've proven that alcohol is dangerous for infants, but the study, the, the best study that I've seen actually came out of Jamaica by uh, Melanie Dreher. She did a five-year study on moms that consume cannabis and compared them to moms that did not consume cannabis, both in vitro and in vivo. And they went back and studied those kids at multiple times uh, up till five years old in 12 out of the 14 factors with everything else, socioeconomic conditions, whether or not the dad was in the house combined, you're basically looking at 12 out of the 14 factors. The children of the root daughters or the women that did consume cannabis actually scored higher than the children that did not. And so right now, the, the information against cannabis saying marijuana is dangerous and bad uh, is spurless at best. The, there's actually very little evidence. And once you take out the socioeconomic factors, like did the mom seek prenatal care, take prenatal vitamins, did she drink or take other drugs, you realize that there's actually zero evidence that marijuana harms the fetus. What there is evidence of harm for, however, is malnutrition. And I'm not suggesting that pregnant women go smoke pot, but if a pregnant woman can't keep food down, can't keep water down, we do know that malnutrition causes damage to unborn children. So it's a matter of harm reduction. And, and I'll tell you what, marijuana has less side effects than any of the prescription drugs that they try to hand you as you're pregnant that have almost no testing as opposed to the 5,000 years of midwifery. That's yeah, been it's really interesting. I mean, I'm coming from with this with absolutely no perspective on anything, but I do remember being terrified of, uh, in my mommy boards, the ladies would say, I just was prescribed this morning sickness drug, but it has all these side effects. I'm terrified it's a class C or whatever. Uh, and it is interesting that in light of the uh, future legalization in America of weed, that we wouldn't think about looking at some of the positives. Cheryl, I have to ask you because you've got your daughter right here. You've got a television camera in the background. Um, she was talking about the benefits of nursing and the benefits of things. Did you nurse your daughter that's right here next to you? Do you want to know what's interesting is actually I had really bad um, uh, morning sickness when I was pregnant with this little one. And I did, I can't, I can't remember what the drug was that they gave me for morning sickness, but I did. I'm going to embarrass you. No, poor, no, no, no. Poor little Amy has a deformed, um, there's a, a little deformity. And um, I think that was because of the pharmaceuticals. But, but what's interesting is um, I did nurse both of my daughters. And other than that, they were very healthy and they've turned out to be amazing, beautiful young women. So they you know, found I, a lot of those drugs caused a lot of those problems. And they've yeah. been prescribed for many, many years. And, and unfortunately, the drugs right now that they try to prescribe to me, as a matter of fact, have zero human trials. They're basically looking at lab rats and saying, well, it didn't hurt them. So you might be fine. Might be fine. Of course, we've only we, been using it for a few years. So let me know in 20. A woman named Shalene Title who helped legalize cannabis in the state of Colorado, who is currently pregnant. And she did a video for Ladybud magazine, and I had this similar experience with her when we were pregnant. A lot of anti-nausea drugs are prescribed off-label. So essentially, what Dale's saying is true, that we're treated as guinea pigs. Some of these drugs can cause long-term and lifelong uh, neurological disorders, uh, facial twitching, um, you know, Listness, listlessness, uh, leg spasms, um, and cannabis, when tested in a legal market and medicinally available with controls to protect us against perhaps pesticides or molds, is a, an innocuous substance that's been used for thousands of years. Um, to prescribe pregnant women untested, long-term, potentially dangerous substances and pharmaceuticals is unconscionable to me because it's toxifying to the mother and to the child. 
And I, for one, take great offense to the medical community refusing to do more research and stand up for cannabis because they take an oath to do no harm, to help people be more productive citizens, to work within their own conscience and not hold cannabis as a political prisoner. Well, okay. Well, I have to say that this is such a multifaceted conversation. Cheryl, regarding your your daughter, Nikon has to say, deformity, I can't see it from here. But one of the things people are curious, and one of the things that you're doing is, is educating individuals who have no information whatsoever, might be a neutral or blank slate. So what were the specific ways in your experience parenting your daughter that marijuana made you a better mother? Well, um, the very first experience that I had with medical marijuana was actually in 1996, and it was just when Prop 215 had been passed here. And I was going through a a horrific, very stressful divorce, um, a very public um, embarrassment. It was a very difficult time. And I was, was, you know, like everyone in L.A., I was seeing a therapist, and um, he had started recommending antidepressants and then anti-anxiety and then a sleeping pill. So um, at one point, they had me up to 80 milligrams of Prozac a day. Um, I was taking like three sleeping pills a night and still not being able to sleep. And then I'd have to take another pill to wake up and go to work. Meanwhile, I had two small children, and after months of frustration and, quite frankly, feeling like a zombie. It's yeah, it's hard to function without I mean, all those prescription pills. Amy can tell you that, I, I mean, I feel sad because I remember, yeah, I my really children are on the for you to get out of bed some days. Just because. On the prescription they pills. Were such a I was like a zombie. And uh, one day, my therapist, my therapist said, it was so funny, he must have been uh, medicated or stoned at the time because he literally put down his prescription pad and he said, lady, you need to smoke a joint. And I looked at him like, I mean, at first I didn't know what to think. At first I thought maybe you had your previous bad experiences with it. So, well, then you had a good experience, but no, for a doctor, for my doctor doctor to tell me. And first of all, I didn't, I didn't know anything about prop 215. I wasn't Mm -hmm. an activist at that time. All I knew was that I felt like a zombie from prescription medication. Mm -hmm. My children, my poor children had no quality of life with their mother because I was, I was literally lifeless. So how did you go from your doctor basically saying, forget the pills, smoke up a joint, to actually obtaining the joint to smoke? Oh, that's the best part. (laughs) He had his own garden in his backyard and rolled one up for me. (laughs) I mean, I got to tell you, I mean, I, I, I was like, Dr. Goss, my God, okay. You know, and he actually taught, I had never smoked a cigarette before. And I, I tried it, and I coughed my lungs up at first, and I, he tried to show me how to take a proper hit, and I felt like an idiot. I was a 35-year-old woman of two children, and I felt like I was back in high school with the stoner boy who happened to be my psychiatrist. <laughs> so it was a very surreal experience. But I do have to say, I mean, that first experience was not so pleasant because it really irritated my throat, and it was very harsh. However, um, I really uh, learned, I learned quickly <laughs> that... I, well, I, I, I knew that instantly I felt better. Mm-hmm. On the very first two puffs, even though it, it was abrasive to my throat, I felt better. And within a month, because it takes almost a month for antidepressants and all of that pharmaceutical garbage to get out of your system, I started having a better quality of life. My and children had noticed our it. mom back. Yeah. And that's my the testimonial you hear over and over and over again is a lot of these other drugs, be it alcohol or self-medicating, you know, with that or prescription drugs that someone else is prescribing to you, you become absent. You become an absent parent. And marijuana, cannabis, allows you to be present, present with your children, present with your family, present to sit down on the floor and play a stupid game for two hours with a two-year-old because it's a little boring <laughs> sometimes, you know, but <laughs> just present um, rather than absent. And that's, it's, it's unfortunate that, you know, Cheryl's doctor, don't say his name out loud, can actually lose license for doing that because doctors are not even allowed to share with their patients. They're not supposed to anyway. They clearly have a friendship outside of, of the practice. But, you know, in normal doctor-patient relationships without that friendship, he can actually lose his license to be able to prescribe other drugs. Uh, you cannot aid or abet a felony as a doctor. So once you tell a patient that cannabis might help you, you then cannot 
uh, tell the patient how much, where to find it, what not to do, how much to do. It's 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 well, reminds me very hole. much of the fact that you know when you go into labor and you're like, I would like my homeopathic things that I you know that would help. And your doctor's like, I have nothing. To, I can't advise you on this because it doesn't come from a, a drug box. It's very complicated. Uh, well, and that's the truth of it because it's not done that. Yeah. Well, right. And, well, here's and, you know, a lot of people. I, I want to get to this point because I really like this because it, I feel like I feel like we are uh, getting rid of a lot of in fears and, and worries people have and getting some really good information. One of the things, as, as someone who, Nikon will make fun of me, I don't know much about this world, uh, that I liked to watch the little drug shows, though, where they had the bus and you see all the, all the little things. And frequently, the community would talk in this very hushed way about the children would come from these houses where the parents were smoking and they would smell like marijuana and they were like a little zoned out and they'd have contact highs. Um, is there anything to that or is there anything you can speak to whether or not that is even a problem? You know, it, there is a big problem with the, the whole like, what about the children? What about the children? Let's talk about a house that uses cannabis rather than prescription pills. As a mom of a two-year-old who gets into everything, I would much rather him stumble across a cannabis cookie or even just straight cannabis than a bottle of aspirin, which can actually kill him. Uh, you know, I think the contact high part is, is a lot of mythology because you actually have to heat up the cannabis or decarboxylate the THC before it's even psychoactive. So unless that kid happened to go toss it in the microwave to get to 350 degrees, it's not actually likely uh, that there was anything to do with a contact high. And over and over and over again, we've gone back and looked at these families and shown that unless there's something else going on, and I mean something else like methamphetamines or alcohol, then those children are actually in excellent environments and we are going in and seriously screwing that up. And I want to point out too, what about the children? What about the children that are suffering from grand mal seizures daily? That, As a mom, whether or not I choose to consume cannabis, I want to be able to have that choice for my loved ones if they need it. And I'm watching small children die from seizures when they had access to cannabidiol or, or cannabis, uh, one of the constituents in cannabis, the seizure stopped. And then as soon as the law changed in their state, they couldn't get access anymore and the child died. I mean, it's not just about moms, uh, you know, and yeah. ask a cop the last time he walked into a domestic violence situation when someone was smoking pot versus drinking Jim Beam. Hey, Dale, I'll, I'll answer yeah. that. I also want to. Wait, I want to hear. I would love to. I, I, I want everybody to talk. I love you all. This is so exciting. But I would like our law, our ex-law of, uh, um, official and also marijuana mommy. To well, jump I'm not in. a mar well. See, I'm not a marijuana mom. See, I'm here. I don't smoke pot. I I will absolutely admit it. When I was in high school, I smoked pot. I am not a patient. I am not a user. I am here simply as an advocate for ending our destructive policies. And Dale raises a point. If you really get to the nutshell, bottom line. You know, this is my anecdotal history in law enforcement, but I have spoken to hundreds of other police officers. In my almost 22 years of law enforcement, I never once walked into a house where someone was under the influence of, of, of marijuana who raped and pillaged the neighborhood, beat their wife and children, or molested them. I would much rather, as a public safety uh, uh, concern deal with someone who's under the influence of marijuana than alcohol. I was in an officer involved shooting and, and the guy who tried to, to kill me was drunk. I've been involved in car crashes because of drunks and, and you know, people who abuse uh, other illicit substances. So we have to separate out quite clearly it, it is an, an incremental step. Marijuana needs to be legalized. You know, we talk about what about the children. Here's the message that we send our children. We're going to legalize marijuana because just like other adult behavior, there are things that adults can do that children shouldn't do. And I wrote an article about what's the best way to educate your kids concerning, you know, marijuana. If you tell your kids that abstinence only is the only way you are going to screw up your child. We have to use harm reduction strategies in everything that we do with our children, whether it's sex. I had a boy, so it was, you know, fighting, fast cars, you know, alcohol, pot, and other drugs. Our job as a parent is to provide appropriate information, 
and then give them guidance and have them delay risky behavior until they're old enough to understand the consequences. Very well said. Dale, yeah. I mean, not, I'm sorry, not Dale. Uh, well, well, I just I have to say, to just start being honest. Well, with I, kids too. I give you when all you credit. Y'all are being so honest, and it's really interesting because uh, because it, it's an interesting perspective. It's it's a very unique way to get knowledge out about because, as you know, if there's anything America will jump on, it's something that a mama does. So, so I I greatly appreciate all of you joining me here tonight. I think T.L. Stryker says it best with his very short comment: "Go, mom." And with that, this mom's going home, but not without thanking all of you for watching us and staying in the comments and checking out what's coming up next, because that's what matters. We appreciate it. We appreciate you. See you next week, because the conversation will continue here at HuffPost.